mid afternoon, whatever time of day it is that you are listening, folks. Thank you very, very much for listening. Day today is the 12th of April, year of our Lord 2024. Welcome to yet another edition of the Coping Hour, hosted by Nicholas Hinkle, aka Motown Noah. Got a couple things on the docket up top for you guys today. Um, let's start with a, a rousing edition of things I saw this. I'm just trying to rack my brain. I've been sitting here for like 30 minutes. I'm like, do I have any housekeeping? Do I have any things? Anything that I want to say. I don't think there's anything major that I need to let you guys know about up top. I might as well just jump right into the show. Things I saw this week. So it was the other night, and I'm I'm kind of sitting around. I'm like, I, I got the I got the night open. You know what's on the what's on the docket? What teams are playing? I see that the Spurs and the Thunder are playing. Oh, wow, impressed. Okay, I'll 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 check into that. I've been kind of a Thunder, not a denier, not necessarily a hater, but I've just kind of been like, yeah, like Shea is cool, J Dub is cool. Chet's not cool, but he's good. Like, all right, fine, I'll watch them. Plus, Victor Wembanyama. I want to watch Victor Wembanyama. Turn on the game as the opening tip is happening. Victor Wembanyama not playing. Eh, next, and then what ends up happening? Like 30 minutes later in real time, the Spurs are down by like 25. Okay, good decision by me. It's like, oh, all right, well, the oh, oh, okay, well, the Bucks and the Magic are playing. Oh, that's an easy choice. I have been a Magic hater and a Magic denier. I don't really like anybody on that team. And it's Milwaukee. They've been in a tailspin. And, and why don't I see for my own two eyes what's going on with them? Because I haven't watched them in like a week and a half. All right, okay, let's do that instead. Where the hell's Giannis? Oh, yeah, last night, the second night of a back-to-back, he hyperextends his – or no, that was the that's what he did in the playoffs a couple of years, not hyperextended his knee. It looked like he may have ruptured his Achilles. Luckily, it was just a calf strain and things are fine. I don't know if there's a least uh, – a less reassuring coach in the NBA than Doc Rivers. We're sitting there and we're like, hey, Doc, is he going to be all right? And he's like, I have no idea. He's <laughs> like, so I'm going to be honest with you. I'm fucking terrified. <laughs> I have no idea. He's like, I'm Doc Rivers and I'm scared. Okay. And then it, he ended up being, you know, Giannis is fine. They're just shutting him down for the rest of the regular season. It's only a handful of games, like three or four games, whatever. He'll be back for the playoffs. And I do think that's the part that people forget is it's like, dog, he hyperextended his knee, and it looked like he was down and out, and then like a week later put up 50 in a closeout game of the NBA Finals. He's probably going to be fine, you like to imagine. But then also, wouldn't it just be, of course, this is just how it happens for Milwaukee this year. I don't know, man. He's just kind of been Superman in moments like this. So not really worth harping on it too much. I was just saying all of this just to say I tried to turn on two games, and then it's like, if the player that I'm watching this game for isn't playing, I'm not going to watch this game. Like, the Bucks are fun to watch without Giannis, but I'm not watching them for 48. I'm just not. I'm not watching them for 48 minutes. So I go, all right, well, who else is on? All right, fine. Dallas and Miami is, is in the second quarter. All right, fine. I'll do that. If I have to watch the Mavericks, fine. I, you put a gun to my head. I, Backs up against the wall. I'll I'll watch the Dallas Mavericks if I have to. So I put that game on, and the Mavs are up by, like, six. And then by the end of that game, I'm, like, not entirely convinced that Miami's not just, like, a middle school AAU team. What the fuck's going on over there? To be fair, they were without a few guys. They were. I don't remember who wasn't playing in that game, but they did have some guys. Terry Rozier was one of them, and I think there was somebody else. It was like, okay, yeah, that's if he's not playing, whatever. No Terry Rozier. Okay. Like, it was, it was bad enough that Kevin Love is, like, playing some semi-significant minutes in this game and actually hitting some big shots. But sometimes you just kind of look at Kevin Love and you're like, God damn, you're still here. You're still here. You're still hooping. He's had a handful of games this year, hasn't he? I don't know, man. The sentiment from that game, from me, outside of the one that I just said, was it's going to be weird when Kevin Love retires. I think it's going to be really weird. Because I talked a couple of weeks ago about how Anthony Davis's like legacy is going to be weird. And I'm really interested to see what happens to him post LeBron, whether it's, you know, through virtue of LeBron leaving the Lakers, which I don't think is going to happen anytime soon. Um, if he does, I think it'll be like his literally his last year. He'll just go somewhere else, wherever, Bronny, whatever. I don't want to talk about that right now. But when LeBron is gone, what is going to happen to Anthony Davis? And is that going to is it going to bump the way that we look at him? Because as it stands, the way that we're going to remember him is as a guy who was a dominant defensive player, but never won defensive player of the year. At this point, that's not going to change. Like at this point in his career, hell no, hell no. Still very good, but hell no. He's always just going to be the guy who was LeBron's number two, and people are going to 
be very blissfully ignorant to the fact that he was a motherfucking problem in New Orleans. People are going to forget about that because when you go to the Lakers, it just it transcends anything else, right? So he'll just be a, a, a historical and, and perpetual LeBron number two. So then I started to think about Kevin Love, and I'm like, whoa, is he different? I mean, you're going to argue, well, he wasn't the number two on those teams. Sure, semantics, what the fuck ever, right? Kyrie has gotten to a point in his career where he will be remembered as somebody who was more than just the guy who played with LeBron, more than the guy who was just LeBron's point guard and hit one of the clutches shots in the history of the NBA Finals, right? But you think about a guy like Kevin Love, and I think comparatively with Anthony Davis, motherfuckers forget about New Orleans, and they it's only going to get worse from here. The you know the more detached we get from it, do the kids remember Kevin Love in Minnesota? I'm just asking if they're just asking questions. Do they remember that, or or does does Kevin Love's history with most people start in Cleveland at this point? At this point, the Kevin Love trade was a damn near decade ago. We're a far cry from Kevin Love putting up 30 and 30 in Minnesota, right? Buzz cut Kevin Love. Like, round mound of rebound Kevin Love. He was a bigger boy. He's coming out of UCLA. He's a bigger guy. All right, fine. The Cavs pull off the trade, and I can't mention Kevin Love in Minnesota without retelling my favorite, oh, my, my favorite what if in probably the history of the NBA. I've spoken about it ad nauseum on this channel at least a dozen times. But it's been a while since I've done it. And to tell you the truth, I don't know if I've done it on this show, you know, 40 some odd episodes deep into it. So it's the summer of, was it 2014? And it's been a few months that we've been hearing that Golden State might pull the trigger on this Kevin Love deal. And it was like, Clay Thompson and Harrison Barnes for Kevin Love and I think it was Kevin Martin. And the interesting thing about Kevin Martin is that he was kind of the another thing I love to talk about. He was like the precursor to James Harden. He was James Harden before James Harden, and he is what gave Daryl Morey the idea for James Harden, which was an offense that was heavily predicated on a guy who can shoot a lot of threes and get to the line a lot. He can generate a lot of contact, and he can get to the line a lot. On smaller volume, mind you, it was like, it, that's why it's the precursor. He was not James Harden, but it was the same picture, dot JPEG. Do you know what I mean? So Golden State is rest. I mean, for months we're hearing about this. Is this the time? It was 2014, because it, it was literally the summer before Golden State won their first championship, and it was when LeBron went home. So it was 14-15, so it was literally 10 years ago. Right now, motherfuckers were talking about Golden State trading Klay Thompson and, and Harrison Barnes for Kevin Love and Kevin Martin. Can you imagine if that would have... I, I, I can... The jersey swaps are so fresh in my mind. Those 42 Kevin Love Golden State Warrior jerseys. Hell, dude, I remember being in summer school and customizing one myself because I was, like, enthralled by this. And then instead, LeBron goes home. The Warriors are like, we're good, actually, with the Splash Brothers. I think we want to see how this plays out. Harrison Barnes was still that bitch even 10 years ago. And LeBron goes home, and my first thought is, oh, my God, is this about to happen? It did. It did. So so what was the timeline on that? And this one I may be a little fuzzy on. I'm kind of trying to do it on the fly. So they draft Wiggins, right? And then there's the whole, oh, you can't trade him immediately. You have to wait X amount. I think it was 60 days that they needed to wait to trade Andrew Wiggins. And that entire time was when people, hey, Golden State, if you're going to motherfucking do this thing, you got to do it now. Because the second that Andrew Wiggins is is eligible to be traded, he's out of there. Okay. It's exactly what happened. It's exactly what happened. Kevin Love goes to Cleveland. He wears number zero in honor of the state of Ohio. And he's like the golden boy for X amount of years. So much so that even when the band broke up, Dan Gilbert was like, we need a remnant of this championship team to stick around to help the young guys, to help the Darius Garlands, the Colin Sexton's, the Jetty Osmonds of the world. We want a veteran in the locker room who's been to the promised land. In the land, mind you. 
And this is another one. And Kevin Love was just like, this is the perfect opportunity to bully the shit out of Colin Sexton for like three years until one of us, you know, throws enough of a temper tantrum and, and, and gets kicked off the fucking team. Turns out that was Kevin Love. Turns out that was Kevin Love. I can't mention Kevin Love without talking about the fact that he emailed me one time. And uh, probably one of the first videos uh, that I ever made that people knew about, which was me standing uh, up on the north side of the city right in front of the lake, you know, the skyline in the background. And I just talked about mental health and 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 how it pertains to the people who watch the NBA as well as the people who play in it. And what prompted this, I, th sure, I don't remember what prompted. I think I was just emotional. I think that's just why I recorded the video. I don't think it stemmed from anybody doing anything. Because I don't remember when Kevin Love came out in the Players' Tribune and, and he wrote this uh, very, very moving and compelling piece about the shit that he's been through and the anxiety that he was dealing with. And at the time, he had also tweeted out, hey, here's my email. Send me some shit. Let me know about your stories and, and your journeys, you know, battling, uh, you know, whatever struggles it is that you have that you deal with mentally and I was so early to the tweet it was like within like 30 seconds that I saw it I was like I'll cook something up maybe he'll see it and so I spent about five minutes being like hey Kevin Love I hate myself too <laughs> like this is uh, this is valid man this is all real and I'm happy to hear this from you and you know I could pull up the email it's probably super cringe and I wouldn't want to read it it's also a little you know personal and intimate a couple months go by and I don't know how I found out about it, but he had emailed me back within like 15 minutes. I didn't even know. Not to say that if I had seen it in real time that I could have emailed him back and like gotten his number and me and Kevin Love would have been boys. Like, no, no, but I just felt really bad and I did end up replying. And another, you know, I'm not going to read what he said back to me. It was, it was super generic and vanilla, you know, I could have easily have been a control C, control V delete the name and enter my name it could have easily have just been something like that but it meant a lot to me so i'm saying all of this just to say how are we going to remember kevin love i don't want him to be forgotten but part of me thinks that's exactly what's going to happen part of me thinks that people aren't going to remember how well he rebounded and how well he shot threes and and was kind of in some way a little revolutionary for his time and his position, no, in, just in terms of what he was capable of on offense, I don't know. Maybe I'm not the guy to have that conversation. You know, another thing that I I noticed out of this game, uh, this this Dallas Miami game, and I'm I'm about to spend a couple minutes talking, like talking way too much about something that it doesn't bother me that much. It's the idea of it that I find very funny. And I should preface it with I love Doris Burke. I think the dream NBA panel right now for a broadcast would include her. I think that she has a position on ESPN's A team calling basketball games. Okay. Let's get that clear. However, <laughs> so Kyrie gets to the basket and he, you know, he throws up some voodoo shit layup and it goes in. And Doris is like, I just can't help but think, that people don't realize how how good he would be if he was 6'6". Six, six. The fuck? What if he was, Doris? If my aunt had wheels, she'd be a bicycle. The fuck are you talking about? What if Kyrie was 6'6"? Six, six? Is this a podcast? Like, what are you talking about? My girlfriend's like, stop being mean to her. She's like, stop being mean to her. She has to talk the whole day. She's got to talk for like three hours straight. She's going to, she's going to say some stuff. I'm like, I don't have a problem with what she, well, I guess maybe I do have a problem with what she said. Imagine if Kyrie was six, six. What if he was, he's not though. <laughs> I don't know. It's like, how many years have we been like, imagine if there was just a guy in the NBA who was like seven, five and could dribble and could pass and could shoot and didn't have to jump to dunk and could take off from the... And then Victor Wembanyama was like, wait, well, he does exist. And I'm him. It's me. It's nice to meet you. Here's the thing that bothers me the most about Victor Wembanyama this season. Oh, my God. How about, first of all, timeout, record scratch freeze frame, 
You're probably wondering how Victor Wembanyama got here. Motherfucking Nike. That's who. The Victor Wembanyama logo, no fucking notes. None. Zero. Mwah. Chef's kiss, Nike. Holy smokes. Love it. And then there was also this little, like, expo that they did. And they unveiled the, like, prototype signature. Sneaker for Victor Wimbanyama. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. It literally looks like an alien sneaker. I, I've, it's, folks, look it up. It's bananas. And I, it just makes you so grateful that it was Nike. And there's this growing trend in the NBA. Guys going to Puma, guys going to Converse. Anta had a little bit of a run, but these days it is sort of Converse and Puma. New Balance is making a little bit of noise. I'm so thankful that Nike was able to get Vector Women Yama because anybody else would have fucked this up. But Nike nailed it. I love it. Here's what bothers me about Vector Women Yama. Pisses me off. How many... I could probably make a 15-minute supercut this season of dudes throwing entry passes. They are not lobs. They're not. It's an entry pass that Victor Wembanyama turns into a lob, and he fucking dunks it. What? You're like, huh? Or the amount of times that he'll take off, and I don't know the way that his body is and the trajectory of it. You're like, he's gonna he's gonna go high glass on this one, and it's a dunk. And the way that he's able to reach and extend his body and just dunk is like, the fuck. What is this? What are we doing here? I've just, you know, what what am I supposed to sit here and say, you know, 17 minutes into today's show about Victor Wembanyama that you haven't heard 50 people say 17 different ways this season, you know? But if I'm the Spurs, what, like, what's, we, I don't want to spend too much time on this because we just talked about them in the last episode in terms of, like, what are you going to do? Jacob, a.k.a. Rusty Buckets, I think one of his better takes is, like, when you have a player like this, it needs to happen immediately. You need to start doing shit immediately. Because even though I don't, it, we're not really under the impression that Victor Wembanyama is in a hurry to get out of San Antonio, you never really want that to be something that crosses his mind. And after one year, I am not saying that it is. I am not saying that it is. We can already tell, though, that this motherfucker is going into next year as a, one of the 15 best players in the NBA. At least. At worst, He's one of the 15 best. No? Okay. I would want to maximize the shit out of this window immediately while he's like a 20-year-old who can give you a 30-point 5-by-5 game. That's what I would want to do. You know, it's been exhausting to me. I'm over it. I'm over it. Mm -mm. The MVP conversation. Oh, Boring. It's crazy to me how people have made it so boring. Also because I think it's it it's devolved into what it always devolves into, which is like I I always try to talk about this and I just I lack the vernacular to do it. I do not have a way to articulate this. But there's a problem with our culture which is like taking things to the absolute extreme as soon as somebody disagrees. And then the person who disagrees with you is going to take it to their extreme, and then you're just in an, in an extreme off, right? This, this whole $20 fast food thing is a, uh, is a good example, actually, where motherfuckers are pissed that uh, people working at In-N-Out in California are making $20 an hour. They're like, you build, you you can make you make make a hundred thousand dollars. You make you make eighty thousand dollars working at fast food. That's not math, but they're really upset about it, and they're like, you don't even do anything, and they're taking it to the ultimate extreme to like devalue whatever the worth is. By the way, these are the same people who were deemed essential workers and were like the only people who were able to actually make food for you <laughs> during COVID, right? Especially in California. Yes, yes, they deserve twenty dollars an hour. But then you have the people on the other side of it who are treating them like they're fucking doctors. Treating them like they are the bravest workers in the world. It's a high-stress job. I'm not shitting on people who work fast food at all. At all. That job fucking sucks. And you should get paid more than $8 an hour. Get paid $20 an hour. 
But damn, dude, the extremes that people take it to to counter the people who are saying that they should get they they should go back to getting paid a nickel sucks and it's annoying and it turns it into such a, a volatile and radioactive conversation. It's annoying. They should get paid and that's it. That's it. End of discussion. Right? And it's it's turned into something similar with the MVP. But th- but this happens every year where you want to qualify your guys so bad that you either diminish or completely ignore the other guy or guys plural. I'm seeing these a lot of an alarming amount of takes about how Jokic won the MVP the other night by beating Minnesota, which by the way, just as a, as a quick note for posterity, for those who command it, how many fucking times are these two teams going to play? Have Minnesota and Denver not played like three times in the last three weeks? What the fuck? What's going on there? So, okay. All right. Jokic monster game, monster game against Minnesota for sure. Potentially locked up the one seed with it. We'll see, but it was just really big step in the right direction. Okay, so what about a week and a half ago when Rudy Gobert bitched Jokic? Did that not count? Did that not count? And this isn't, I'm not saying one way or another. I'm not saying that that Jokic does not deserve to win MVP. I'm saying on the strength of one game, really, because it was a high stake. So the MVP can be won in a single game in the in the middle of April. Oh, okay, that's interesting. So all Luka has to do is put up like 80. And we'll have, well, I have to reconcile with, as long as it's against a team that's like good. It's a, just a horse shit argument. Bothers me. And it's the same people who are, like, overcorrecting for Shea because they're so deeply offended that he's not – he's just not in the mix and people just don't want to talk about him anymore. And I, am I one of them? Yeah, a little. But it's not in a way that I'm like, Shea sucks. I made my point very clear on that. Do it again next year. Do it again next year. Because a lot of things can be true here. Oklahoma City overachieved. In the eyes of the public, if you ask a Thunder fan, they knew what was coming. Cool. Good for you guys. I'm not talking to you right now because you know you know where you're at with this, right? And I don't want to. <laughs> Two, the best player on the best team in the NBA gets a seat at the table. It's what we were talking about with Jason Tatum a couple months ago, right? By all accounts, Oklahoma City, one of the best teams in the NBA at certain points this season, they have been the best team in the NBA. So we got to talk about Shea great when was the last time that the nba gave the mvp to a guy who did it once that's my stance so if they do it again next year then we're gonna have to have a real conversation about it but the guy who's been winning mvps the last few years more or less doing the exact same shit that won him the mvps of the past and i'm gonna keep referring to the point that candace parker made i'm gonna do it in every single fucking episode until the mvp is given out to somebody if this was the first year that Jokic was doing what he is doing, is he the MVP? Mm. And then people want to talk about Luka. I don't... <sighs> it's boring to me now. I don't care anymore. I don't, know, I don't know how to articulate it. I spent, you know, four minutes here talking about it, and it just... It's just boring to me. I, I'm looking at a guy... I don't want to... I could bring up Jalen Brunson. There's no use in me bringing up Jalen Brunson. It's not going to happen. But then with Luka, you're like... If it doesn't fucking happen this year, when is it supposed to happen? Is my question. And 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 this is how the NBA, it almost feels like traps themselves. Because if you don't give it to Luca this year, then you're gonna have to reconcile with a makeup MVP at some point. You've done it in the past. You've done it a handful of times in the last fifteen years. Are you ready to do it again? Because if you don't give it to him this year, you're going to probably have to. We'll leave it at that. I totally forgot to mention this. A week ago, Malachi Flynn puts up 50. And we say on this show, okay, all right. So Luca puts up 70, Embiid has 70, and Cat has 60. And then the All-Star game goes south in a way that like it's over there's just competition's gone in the all-star game whatever that's fine and so the nba is trying to correct what they've done to the league and they're swallowing their whistles and you know nobody's going to the line and okay scoring is down around the league and that was the that was the league's response to this uh scoring burst that we had seen 
cool. And I said, how the fuck are they going to correct for Malachi Flynn dropping 50? What are they going to do? Uh, and then Boston and Milwaukee happened. And then Boston goes 48 minutes and doesn't shoot a free throw. Milwaukee only shot two. They were both from Giannis. Like a minute into the game, I think. The fuck? I didn't... Are we still all kind of shocked from that? Are we still all kind of like, that was real? How does that happen? And you have, uh, was it Missoula or was it, uh, I think it was Doc. It was like, I, the game's over after an hour 57. And they hand me the stat sheet and I go, no, 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 I need the full game. He thought it was halftime. He thought it was halftime because there was no fouls on the thing. That's bizarre. Imagine, here's what's funny to me. Imagine that's the game. That you decided to treat yourself and you splurged. You got you courtside. You know, you're in the first five rows. You're you're down there, man. You've never been this close to an NBA game before. And it's the fastest game that's been played probably ever. Probably ever. I gotta I got something for you guys. I got a little take here. As it pertains to Wilt Chamberlain. I think the NBA this is a very hard pivot. I don't know why I just went from Boston and Milwaukee. Wilt Chamberlain. I think the NBA needs to cut the cut the music on this guy. Pump the brakes. I think it's over for Wilt Chamberlain. Sneaky. And I think that they need to I don't know if they need to adopt like a like an A D B C like mode of timekeeping as it pertains to Wilt Chamberlain. Maybe like an A, W, and B, W before Wilt and after Wilt. Because I'm fucking tired of it, man. I'm tired of dudes doing absurd shit. And then there are graphic flashes. I mean, something we haven't seen in 60 years. And then the graphic flashes, and they're like, oh, but Wilt did this 13 times in a, in a week. Wilt did this 13 times in a, in a season. Okay cool there's not that much footage of it there's just not I was talking to someone about it the other so i'm just saying like i think we need it motherfuckers love to talk about the merger oh well, this is the most double doubles since uh since but since the merger happened it's four teams it's four teams who cares it's hardly anything the nba's done half of that when they've expanded they're gonna do that again by the end of the decade when they add seattle and vegas might as well do it there's just two less teams the fuck that doesn't mean anything. Pre-merger. It's four teams. Shut the hell up. Do I do I want to do an OJ thing really quick? Made a video about it yesterday. And if I could if I can I don't I do not like to do this at all. If I can pat myself on the back a little bit. I had a moment yesterday where I was like this is what I'm supposed to do. This is what I was put on this earth to do. When I tell you, not 15 seconds after I was done reading the news that Orenthal James Simpson was dead, my first thought was to get in front of a microphone. I was like, I don't know what I'm feeling right now, but it needs to be documented. And I am somebody, so I'm not going to, I don't, I, I said, you know, I always love to say, I'm not going to talk about it too much here. And then I, you know, eight minutes later, I'm like, so that's my thoughts on that. I did record a video yesterday about it. It's five minutes and change. It's very quick if you want to go check it out. But it, it, it really is a day like today that you miss Norm MacDonald. You really do. And if it, it sucks that OJ outlived him. <laughs> it really sucks that he did. Because you know that he would have been on like, they would have they would have brought him back on SNL. And he would have done Weekend Update. And he would have gotten off like a, I don't, I don't know. But that was his whole deal. I was trying. I was like, can I do a Norm impression? Do I have a joke, like a Norm OJ joke chambered? I kind of want to try to do an impression on the fly, but now I've started to talk about it too much. And if I do, I'm, I, this episode is actually starting to bother me. I don't know if I'm like feeling, if I'm like in the middle of like a manic episode and I'm about to have like a breakdown, but I'm 30 minutes in and I can, I don't like this episode at all. So I'm going to keep talking about OJ. I'm going to talk myself through it. You know, we love to talk about on this show notoriety and status and celebrity and 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 truly what 
OJ created in the Kardashians cannot be understated. No? I'm going to cut this. I'm going to cut, and we're going to move on to something else. I, I'm i upset. Copinghoursubs at gmail.com is the email to the show if you want to send anything in. Uh, potentially have it read on the show. We got an email from Zilch. Zilch, welcome to the show, man. This was in my spam folder. I just want you to know that. I do check my spam because sometimes some emails slip through the crack and they're so stupid that they go to spam because Gmail is like, there's no way. There's no way that this is a real person. Uh, this is, though. And the format, the subject line here is uh, Alan Iverson was damn near a pornographer. That's literally not how you play basketball. That's the subject line. Okay. And the format of this email is like, there's a screenshot of an email, like text box that he typed out a full email and then sent a follow-up. I don't know why you sent me a fucking screenshot of an email that you wanted to send and you didn't just send me the email. So let me, let me read this. Let me read this. You know, typically I try not to read dumb emails. You know, you guys give bad takes and shit and I don't read them. Because I'm like, all I'm going to do is be mean to this person. I'm just going to, like, use it as a vehicle to dunk on them. That's all. And I'm like, you know what, man? It's good for some of you to just have an outlet and get your stupid takes out. But apparently I'm in a bad mood right now. So I'm going to read this. And I want everybody to go, what the fuck is this guy talking about? Even if it's funny. It might be funny. You might laugh at it. it in like a, okay, all right, cool. We're all on the same page. Let's read the email. Zilch, welcome to the show, dude. Allen Iverson is not a cultural icon. He bastardized the sport with that bullshit carry crossover. He had middle schoolers doing it in 2006 thinking they were going to the league because they could pull off such a non-basketball act that was considered basketball. What I'm most importantly referring to is the fact that Allen Iverson's crossover is not goddamn basketball and it's the furthest thing from it. Now, since Allen Iverson carried, we don't call... Now, since Allen Iverson carried, we don't call other carries unless we're just letting Iverson's carries go and only calling other people's carries. In theory, Allen Iverson bastardized the whole concept of dribbling a basketball. Behold, your cultural icon, the same culture that voted in Donald. And it's not done. I'm sorry, it's not done, folks. Back to the email. Pornography. Not a term I use loosely, but can be loosely, and more importantly, colloquially, 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 as it spreads awareness to the thickest humanocentric dopamine rush, including curated to do so I don't, like, I, are you schizophrenic, dude? This is fucked. I don't know what you're talking about here. And I'll read the, I'm not finishing this. This is a stupid, this is dumb. And I'm going to read the follow-up email here. Extended subject line. Extended. Allen Iverson, the NBA's porn star, a theory. Allen Iverson is literally a porn star in every aspect of the word and position. The good, bad, ugly, and downright depraved. The NBA more than underhandedly exploited Allen Iverson and his style of play, completely doing ir irreversible damage to the sport of basketball itself. Allen Iverson himself. The NBA is a business in future generations of humans that choose to play basketball as a product of being introduced to it through American culture. And then at the end, included very earnestly and generously, it may be too deep. I apologize. It may be complete bullshit. I apologize. I'm going to tell you right now, just so we're being fair. If this is a bit, good job. Funny. It's funny. I'm not laughing, but it's funny because I'm in a bad mood. But it's good. And it's very thorough. And you made it seem very believable. If this is a bit, okay? So I applaud you and I commend you for that. But two things here. One, it's going to be really hard for you to convince me that this is a bit because you seem pretty fucking serious to send two emails back to back about this. Okay. If you're being fucking for real, I honestly don't know. And this is a little bit to your point that he was a very influential player. So I can't use that as a counterpoint to what you're saying because you're saying that that's what the problem is. You know, man, what most people think about Allen Iverson is that he was the one who popularized, like, street moves in the NBA. That's it. And he's also the one who popularized, like, on-court fashion in a lot of ways. Motherfuckers were wearing headbands. Motherfuckers were not wearing shooting sleeves. They weren't. And I think there's something to be said about what he did for 
the you know the culture of basketball on the court and off the court as well. I don't know if there was a more well liked team uh, teammate of his era. And, uh, like, as far as the stars are concerned, right, everybody, everybody fucking loves that guy. You know what else everybody loves about Allen Iverson is that to this day, he is, like, the only dude from a previous generation that no matter what, he's gassing the new guys. He's just, like, he's just cool, man. Like, he's just excited to be here. He's just an awesome dude. So to say, I don't use pornography, I don't use that term uh, loosely— cool most of us do though so it just doesn't what the like i don't i don't know i'm upset that was dumb it was a bad email but i needed to read it unless it was a bit unless it was a bit then it was a good one there was also another one in here it was something about the pistons i don't really remember what it was so we're gonna try to we're gonna find it on the fly uh this one it comes to us from isaiah and the subject line is what are the pistons gonna do with their cap space hey nick uh, Isaiah, welcome to the show. Hey, Nick. I know you and other Pistons fans are nervous that they could pay Miles Bridges, but I don't think that makes sense because he's a Tobias Harris but younger player and a domestic abuser. Grayson Allen feels more likely because y'all are in desperate need of shooting and Phoenix probably won't be able to afford him. I agree with you on the on the Grayson Allen thing. Um, To say that Miles Bridges is just Tobias Harris actually is a compliment to... Miles Bridges in, in in some sense, and the Tobias here. I feel like I fucking talked about this five times on the show, but every other day we have an email about the. What do you think about the Pistons getting Miles Bridges and Tobias Harris? Let's just keep fucking talking about it. Let's keep talking about it. Got to burn an hour somehow. Have I ever told you guys about my my whole Miles Bridges spiel? Fucking did it two episodes ago. Being awfully antagonistic today for somebody who loves his community more than he loves himself. The Pistons going after veteran shooters is the only way that they're going to get out of this. And I can be a team trade the pick all that I want. Who? But I don't... Who the fuck is that supposed to go? Where's that... Who's, 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 who's taking, even if you get the first pick, what's the, what is the best thing that the first pick in this year's draft gets you? Uh, you know, <laughs> is my response. Uh, what if you attach Ivy to it? We're cooking with gas. There's something there. The pick in and of itself is not, uh, you know, standing on its own. It's not going to get you uh, dick or balls. It's not good. It's not a good pick. I'm a... I- I'm not. I'm not convinced, man. I'm. I'm just not convinced that the Knicks aren't going to have this realization that they're just better without Julius Randle. And I think that's where we're going in these playoffs is God forbid the Knicks make a run. Because if they do, they're going to have to be like, the fuck, why are we paying this guy all this money to like jab step, you know? And then you are like, you're faced with, well, who's going to take them though. And I've been really trying to toy with that where if you're, Leon Rose are you like hey Charlotte what's Grant Williams up to like what's his deal do you guys want Julius Randle you guys are about to lose Miles Bridges you want to win games and you're tired of having a bunch of losers on your team you want to give LaMelo something cool do you want Julius Randle is that something that's interesting to you we'd like Grant Williams do you do something like that do you do something like I'm just I don't know where else he would go because he's sure as shit not coming to Detroit. And when we went to the Bulls-Knicks game the other day, Jacob, a.k.a. Rusty Buckets, he made a great point. I haven't been able to stop thinking about it. What if this is, what if this 20 points per game Dante DiVincenzo stretch is just who he is now? It's fun to think about. Like, what if this is just the culmination of him playing alongside some fucking hoopers for his entire career going back to Villanova right playing with a couple of those guys now again is you must have learned this from somebody did he get it from Chris Middleton hmm it, what if the, I'm just think about it for two minutes what if this is just who Dante DiVincenzo is now 
And he just kind of like turned this corner. And now you can just expect like 18 to 20 a game from him for the rest of his career. Like, what does that look like? What does that look like for the Knicks? And that's what I'm saying where these playoffs are going to be fascinating. We could probably, probably do a, a, a quick little peek at the, at the standings here. I'm thinking on Monday, we'll do a more, like a more organized and structured. Cause at that point the season's over and the, the plan will be on the horizon. But there's been some interesting little shakeups here and there, so I think it could be worth. I can't. I don't know. The standings literally just won't. They're just. They just won't. They just won't pull up. I'm gonna. Uh, all right, folks. Uh, we're gonna wrap up today's show. I'm upset. I'm so mad. I'm, I'm not being funny at all. I'm just. Uh, today's just gonna be one of those days. I'm just. I guess I'm just in a bad mood. I don't know what it is. I don't know if I'm like. Is this because of the eclipse? This literally, I was doing fine. My grandma's calling me. My grandma's calling me. We're gonna we're gonna cut until. Hold on, folks. I maybe I'm upset because I know that in my heart the last few episodes have been good, and you know what? I don't need to keep harping on it. <sighs> now the dog starts barking. Let's cut to when he's not barking anymore. I guess today is just like how many things can disrupt <laughs> the show. I wanted to bring up the eclipse and and is it is it is that what's going on here is, is did the eclipse just for, for our non-American listeners suckers didn't get to experience the eclipse bunch of losers we did I was I, I gotta be honest with you guys I was pretty bummed I just I don't know what it was I wasn't moved by it very much I think I think I I like to think that like cosmically I understand our place in a in a way that is more nuanced than I understand most things and I've spent a lot of time like thinking about this and, and reading and, and watching videos and shit documentaries like I I'm very interested in the the the, the cosmos and and the, the grander perception of what we may actually be and so I was excited to see an eclipse for the first time. And we went to a museum and we sat outside on this lawn and handed out glasses. And really what moved me the most and what I think all three of us were moved by was how many people were there. And I love to talk about monoculture all the time. I love when there's something happening in pop culture that everybody is experiencing and, and watching at the exact same time. And we all know that we're experiencing experiencing it at the exact same time down to the second. I love that feeling. It is an indescribable feeling to me. To it's it's just a very human experience, and that's what this felt like to me. Was that all across the country we were experiencing this exact same phenomenon down to the second, and you could see it in real time. You could look around. It's hundreds of people hundreds of people anywhere in the city that you went as long as there was a you know a, a, a some some a, a little patch of grass motherfuckers are, are posted up and I thought that was really cool but that's really all that I got out of it and I you know I, it's sure I get that it's like a one and however many trillions anomaly that our moon and our sun are even like we're the distance away that we are that they can perfectly align in the way that they do I understand the anomaly that that is uh, I guess I was just, I was very whatever about it. I, I don't, I don't know, folks. I hope you guys have a good weekend. Hope you guys are having a better day than I apparently am. I woke, I thought I was fine. I guess I'm not. So, folks, if you are listening to this, God, it pisses me off. I don't know if I've, if I've said this or if I've just meant to say this for a while. Now I gotta system update that's trying to do it and postpone i don't want to fucking do this right now fuck off you know i watch all these podcasts and you hear comedians all the time there's nothing a comedian loves to do more than talk about the industry and to talk about how comedy used to be so much better a couple of years ago you know when we were just horsing around in these little lowly clubs you know oh when i when i used to do second city shut up shut up and then I was like, I do the same shit. I do the same shit. It's just stuff that I care about, and it's just my world. An interesting little reflection there. Like I get, I get very deeply offended when 
a dude just starts a podcast. When a guy goes to Target and gets a, a you know, a mic arm, hooks it up to his dance, latches it to his desk, gets like a sure SM58, although you wouldn't, yeah, you could do that. And is like, I can do this. It makes me feel like my culture is their hobby. <laughs> and I just get very, I get very, very annoyed about it. Because I'm like, have fun. Have fun for a month. And then when you realize that either you suck, or the show sucks, or that you don't have shit to talk about. that you, But who am I? But who am I, right? How many of these damn episodes am I like, I got nothing to talk about. I got nothing to talk about. But you know what I do? It doesn't matter. Folks, if you're listening to this on Spotify, be sure to rate five stars. If you are listening to this on YouTube, leave a like, subscribe. Don't even give me an algorithm comment today. I will catch you guys now in the next one. Beautiful, beautiful.